for example, I, I can't blame anyone but myself unless someone breaks into my house and coughs in my face. If I leave the, I'm a healthcare worker, I'm going to the front lines of the pandemic. If, if I didn't want to get COVID, I would stay home and quit my job. And I'm free to do that. I can do that. I have that freedom. But I'm one of the rare people in society today that is granted that freedom by the government. The rest of, uh, of the people, you know, if you run a, a whatever, a comic book store or a, a movie theater or whatever job is essential for you to put food on the table, while the government says you're non-essential, you can't take risks with your own health. And, you know, the pushback some people will say is, well, you can, you can take risks with your own health, but you can't put other people's health at risk. But, uh, you know, I, I always challenge people to tell me one other person who isn't, uh, isn't accepting the same risk that they're, they're imposing on me if we meet out in public. If you and I meet out in the public space in an unknown territory, who's aggressing against who if we're asymptomatic? Uh, well, either we're both aggressing against each other, in which case it's a consensual meeting of aggression, like bo a boxing match, or neither of us is aggressing. Either way, we're consenting, and libertarians say you're allowed to consent to take risks. And, uh, and, and so no one's getting this virus that hasn't essentially consented to take the risk to get the virus by going out in public and leaving their safe space. All right. So uh, for those watching on YouTube, um, we were talking about uh, Tim's experience as a paramedic during the COVID uh, pandemic. Sorry if the bit was cut off. Uh, we had some issues with the recording. Um, so are you um the big topic of canada right now is uh bill c21 uh what are your opinions on it yeah well i mean c21 is uh has got a lot of it, you know it's the next step in the trudeau gun control uh agenda last year he uh he banned 1500 over 1500 uh, guns, uh, because of how they look, it had nothing to do with their particular function. It wasn't that they were carbine or that they were a particular caliber or, or power. It was just that if they looked scary, if they looked assault style, then they were banned. And, and now C21 is <laughs> kind of the culmination of that. And, uh, it bans not only, um, it adds more teeth, let's say, and they, they want to, for example, use taxpayer money to buy back guns. And, um, you know, this could go skyrocket to the billions of dollars um, and is fraught with all sorts of obvious problems. Like, what, how do they determine which guns you can buy back? Can I make a can I manufacture a gun and then sell it to the government? Is that a potential money making scheme? Uh, airsoft guns, it turns out, are included in the in the ban in Bill C-21. So airsoft guns that look like assault style guns. Are banned, so that's dramatically impacting that sport. And so you can't shoot um, BBs, soft Nerf BBs, at each other anymore. Uh, the other concerning thing about the bill is that it it adds it it not only allows municipalities or cities to ban handguns, but it adds some real teeth to that. So you know, on one hand, you could say, well, look, the federal government should stay out of what cities do if the city wants to have their own rules and regulations around guns let them um you know even a libertarian could maybe get behind that in the, in the name of decentralization but what the government here is doing is adding um criminal penalties to that so normally when a municipality has a bylaw that says thou shall not park here or, or you know you, don't, you can't walk around with the gun um what they do is they issue a fine you don't get a criminal record. You don't go to jail. You you have to pay a fine or something like that. Well, with this uh, Bill C-21, if the municipality has a ban on handguns and you get caught, you could face criminal penalties. You could go to jail and you could be branded a felon. And, uh, of course, this is a terrible travesty. Do you think the forced extraction of firearms will be used to silence um well they say you can be you can have your firearms seized if they uh see you as an extremist do you think it will just be used to silence political opponents yeah well th there's no doubt that this is just another tool in that arsenal i mean they, they uh, silence political opponents in all sorts of ways um 
you know, someone was just asking me um, minutes before this uh, started about big tech censorship and and what I think of that. And of course, um, you know, a lot of libertarians will say, well, that they're a private business, they can do what they want. And, and I agree with that. But the question you ought to ask is, why is it that private business or in quotations, private business is banning only one type of speech and, and they're letting, um, you know, left wing, violent uh, rhetoric, terribly just invigorated rhetoric go unchecked. And it's because um, media, the, the, the bigger government gets, the more media um, that gets licensed from the government favors that their authoritarian agenda. And so, of course, Facebook, the mainstream media, all these big tech giants favor whatever narrative props up big government. Um, it's because they operate on at behest of the government. And so this is how intertwined government is in our lives now, where even private businesses, if they want to keep operating and if they want to flourish, and if they want to be accountable to their shareholders, they have to toe a line that supports the growth of government and totalitarian statism. Well, of course, you're going to see that same thing with this gun control, which is if your narrative does not support big government, if your narrative, if your message challenges is that, you're going to be branded as an extremist. And we're seeing this uh, all over the place already. There was a an ill-advised march in uh, Edmonton recently for some lockdown protesters. And um, these dummies <laughs> used uh, tiki torches. They decided it would be a good idea to light some tiki torches and march downtown Edmonton to oppose the lockdowns. Now, I suspect that some government agent or some leftist suggested it to them, and these people were, were too dumb to figure out that this would not be a good look, that they would be branded as white supremacists or, or white nationalists. Um, they were they were doing some kind of Christian march and it was a light lighting this thing and it, it was supposed to be the Jericho march or something like that. But this is the challenge we have, right? Is that um, everything we do, they're, they're trying really hard to associate freedom and liberty with the most terrible ideologies, fascism, Nazism, uh, white supremacy, and you, you, so, so here we have a group of people, very well intentioned, kind of blundering into this uh, thing accidentally, uh, you know, using these tiki torches that they shouldn't have been using, um, and and they're being branded as a white supremacists that are intimidating uh, everyone downtown. We're not, you know. Meanwhile, the lockdowns and the government isn't intimidating anyone, I guess. But if you look at people on the left doing demonstrations, BLM, Antifa, they can be burning down cities and they're de described as mostly peaceful protests. And, and so um, this is the challenge that we have going forward is, is that even rational libertarians, people that, that have a, a rational, logical argument against the state rooted in deep-seated philosophy who step people through the epistemology of self-ownership and, and how that leads to uh, a conflict-free world, um, we're, we're being lumped in with, uh, fascists with the thing that we're opposite of. And so, um, yeah. And, and that's because our philosophy challenges the, the, the cult of, of the totalitarian state of the omnipotent state. And, um, and that can't happen. And so you'll notice that, uh, anyone who challenges that cult is going to be silenced with whatever means are at the government's disposal. And, um, big tech censorship is one means. Um, uh, th this gun grab is going to be another means. If, if you are, say, something uh, negative about the government, if you hate the state, let's say, um, well, you, you're an extremist and they'll take your guns. So um, you mentioned like how the left um, has been taking advantage of these situations and being able to be violent and all that. Um, do you believe the, with Jack Meet Singh, do you think the NDP is in complete self-destruction right now? Do I think what self-destructing? Sorry. The NDP. Oh, the NDP. Um, I, I think that what is probably happening is they are, they're, it, it's politics. They are squabbling over leadership. I mean, Jagmeet Singh uh, hasn't been a stellar leader. He, he's no 
uh, Thomas Mulk. Yeah, I mean, you think about the the, the leaders they've had, right? Uh, they had, uh, oh man, he slips my, my brain now. The guy that got discovered in a bathhouse. He was well loved. The guy with the mustache who kind of looked like an astronaut. That's how I remember. Oh, him. you mean uh, Jack Layton? Yeah, Jack Layton. Jack Layton was beloved uh, leader. Even people outside the the party loved him. Uh, Thomas Mulcair. He was he was a, a fairly rare, fairly competent leader that people could rally around. But Jagmeet Singh is a polarizing figure um, who hasn't effectively united his party. So I, I suspect what's going on in the NDP is just a lot of people struggling for leadership. You know, I've, I've seen this in my own party in the past. Um, it, you know, people gun for your spot. They throw you under the bus. There's back. It, it, this is kind of politics as usual. So I don't think uh, the left is imploding anytime soon. I think that they're going to keep ramping it up. But I do think a lot of their, um, a lot of their power, like, like they just cried wolf so many times and people are just tired of it and they're seen through it and they're not as scared of being called names like racist and transphobe and homophobe anymore because they've used those words so much they, they they've lost their power and they've lost their meaning. So I think that there is some reason to hope, um, but I, I I don't think that uh, I don't see the NDP uh, going anywhere. You know, they're, they're picking up steam here. I think in Alberta a little bit. Ken, the, the Kenny government is so unpopular right now even among conservatives that um, Rachel Notley is and the NDP is starting to look like, um, you know, a, a viable alternative to them, to a lot of people. So uh, I think they're, they're going to be here to stay. Another um, big, um, well, this is a recent thing that just happened. Um, do you think Dulce uh, 273, the UBI or guaranteed, basic income bill will go anywhere? And if so, will you enjoy those checks? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, I I would be surprised at this point if it doesn't pass in some form. It's probably not going to pass exactly in the form it is. The, the amount of money is probably going to be on the lower side right now. But look, who who in parliament right now opposes it? Only maybe the CPC, you know, you're, you're gonna get support from the NDP, you're gonna get support from, um, you're gonna get support from the Greens. Uh, you, you might even get support from the Bloc. I mean, they, they love handouts out there in Quebec. And, and so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see them support it. They're, they're gonna squabble over the details. It's not gonna be enough for the NDP. The NDP is gonna want, uh, something closer to full communism and the liberals are going to have to tone it back. So they'll, they'll squabble over that. So it might take a while for them to hammer out the details of how much it's going to be. But yeah, you know, I will, uh, I will take the money and I will use it to fight the state. Um, because if I don't take the money, it's just going to go to some commie and they're going to use it for evil. So um, I think it's every good libertarian's duty to confiscate as much money from the state as they possibly can by getting every possible government benefit they, they possibly can. It's not like that money's going to be returned to the taxpayer. It's going to be used for evil if we don't confiscate it. So get as much of that government money as you can um, before it goes to the socialists, I say. So um, you, what other things do you suspect uh, will be... Um some wacky stuff you think will get passed in the Canadian parliament? No, I mean, this is a good question. Well, we, we've seen, for example, um, remember a couple of years ago, they passed motion 103 in parliament, and that was to strike a committee to look at issues of Islamophobia and transphobia and different things like that and to fight hate. And so I suspect we're going to see um, many more uh, bills come out that that address um, hate and um, and clamp down on speech. Um, the, you know, we've we've already had Bill C sixteen, which uh, in some ways, as Jordan Peterson points out, compels speech. In fact, on my podcast today, I, I interviewed a trans woman who is very upset by Bill. C-16 and says it makes things harder for her as a trans woman because now, um, you know, when a, a potential employer 
looking at at her as a an employee has to think well if she, if i hire her is she going to you know make complaints under bill c16 towards her fellow employees cuz you know she used the example of a machinist shop you got tom and jerry over here who aren't the most politically correct guys in the world now she starts working there and the boss has to think well is she going to say something that is going to or is or tom and jerry you know those two excellent machinists but you know not very smart when it comes to using sensitive language are Tom and Jerry over there going to, going to say something that's going to get the company in hot water uh, with this new employee. So she says that, that, you know, bill C 16, which is supposed to be there to support trans women because it compels speech and compels action and compels thought in a lot of ways. Um, people are now going to be, are, are more scared to hire her than ever because of um, the fear of how she could use these uh this new uh bill to to punish companies and people that that might offend her so and she'll never know why she didn't hire but she just gets this sense that it's gonna be a little higher so so we're gonna see i suspect more things like c16 and they're gonna be in the realm now of uh islamophobia um they're gonna target uh, probably um you know anti-islamic uh speech of any kind or criticism they're going to you know, well, look, we saw in the U.S. Um, the ex-CIA director lump libertarians in with white supremacists, fascists, um, and, and some of these figures in terms of hate groups to watch, in, in terms of terrorist groups to watch, right? And after the storming of the Capitol, there was all this rhetoric about putting down people on lists. Canada had similar rhetoric afterwards as well. And, and we could see that they're using, using that as an opportunity uh, to lump libertarians and, and other freedom fighters in to this extremist violent uh, group. And, you know, in Canada, we just saw that uh, the Proud Boys, for example, got put on a terrorist list. Now, I'm not sure what spawned that. I'm guessing because there were one or two Proud Boys at the Capitol uh, Capitol riot or storming of the Capitol. Uh, but, you know, I've met Proud Boys in the past uh, and they, they, you know, they're kind of a quirky bunch. They, they uh, believe Western civilization is the best. And, you know, like all these classical liberal ideas that the West has, and they call themselves Western chauvinists. And they were started primarily as a drinking group that was just proud of living in this society and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and as far as I know, that's what they are still today with a few exceptions you know, there's a bad individuals in every group. Um, and you know, they're, and so, but now the proud boys is labeled a terrorist organization when essentially, um, I suspect they're just a group of basically libertarian lights or, or, you know, kind of libertarian leaning populists that um that love western civilization and then talk about it and drink and and do kind of a weird um uh initiation ceremonies and different things like that like the loyal order of water buffalo for those who watch flintstone uh, the flintstones <laughs> and so I, I think we're but i think we're going to see more of that i think we're going to see more people named to uh terrorist watch lists and it's going to become increasingly difficult for us to have any kind of um rhetoric around uh, that that praises uh the the foundations of western civilization that the individual is sacrosanct that um government ought to be restricted and restrained and its only proper role should be to pre protect the individual not impose on it not serve the collective uh not um you know advance all these progressive agendas and it's clear to see how um how thought and speech is being eroded to the point where uh, where just thinking those things is going to be a problem for these people and how, you know, you know, they'll, they'll be able to say, look, you're pushing back against these ideas. And some people who have these ideas are going to might even use violence. You know, there might be a few libertarians out there who just get to the end of their rope and say, I've got nothing left to lose. And they behave badly. And we're going to get lumped into that. I've seen this happen already, uh, you know, over the course of my uh, tenure as leader of the party, there's been a few libertarian uh, libertarians who have, or or people who even uh, shared a libertarian meme. Let's say they they probably weren't even libertarians, 
um, but they do something violent and then they try to take libertarians down because by saying that our ideas lead to violent extremism. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth. We're trying to oppose violent extremism. We think statism is violent extremism, but this is what's going to happen. I, I think we're, you're going to see a steady erosion of, of speech. I'm not exactly sure what uh, that's going to look like, but <clears throat> these people will use every opportunity to take advantage and, and erode our civil liberties and gain absolute power over our lives. And so it's just going to take one dumb libertarian to do something stupid and, uh, and they'll have legislation waiting in the wings to, to crush us. So I'm guessing whatever users asked about um, Lord Southern, who was a member of the Libertarian Party Canada, and she left um, with, with her more alt-right views. Um, you say that yeah. it's a problem within your party, or was this more of a, you know, when the party was coming up? Uh, to yes. Well, I, you know, the, the, the libertarians I'm talking about had nothing to do with the party. Uh, Lauren Southern, you know, she was a, she's a dynamic person. And, um, you know, we, we've had, I guess there was some controversy with her um, when she first started out as a candidate. I think she was about 19 at the time. And she was doing some weird things that I didn't really get. Like she was going to these slut walks and holding up a sign that says rape culture doesn't exist in Canada. And I'm like, what does that got to do with taxation is theft? I mean, she, does she know we're getting taxed at nearly 50%? To, to me, it was kind of like going to uh, the Special Olympics or something like that and holding up a sign saying you're not very good athletes. Um, it's like, okay, but what, what, what are you trying to prove? What do you, what, what's your point? I don't get it. Um, and, I, you know, I get it now. I, like she, she was in a culture. She, she was exposed to a culture, let's say, in university that... Uh, uh, where this leftist woke narrative was. And, you know, I, I grew up on a farm. I'm in Alberta. I, I, I just haven't seen, hadn't seen this stuff at the time. Um, so, and I, you know what, it, it didn't, it, it, it caused me to scratch my head and go, what, what's she doing? I don't get it. Uh, but I, I never had any thoughts of uh, kicking her out of the party or, or getting rid of her as a candidate. It wasn't until some of the executive in my party uh, started raising some issues and, and painted a picture, let's say that uh, she was, targeting them with her speech uh that that i it became an issue and we had a bit of a falling out but then we patched things up i brought her back in and she explained herself when she explained herself to me um you know i got that my executive was kind of being hyperbolic and exaggerating and those executive parted ways um and so lauren lauren and i are in good terms and she ran as a candidate um but yeah i mean she 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 kind of went down a different path uh, she was more concerned about, uh, you know, borders than she was about government power, it seemed. Um, I'm the other way around. I, I get the concern about borders, but I, I'm really concerned about government power. And um, and I, I think the primary goal of any libertarian ought to be to figure out how we can shrink government, how we can get government uh lower and um she seemed to be really concerned about people migrating here and there um so we kind of parted ways. she would and, and i think she found a niche for herself too she got all sorts of um likes i guess and popularity by by kind of finding a niche in that area for herself she made quite a bit of money doing it and and quite a bit of fame and notoriety so uh good for her um and you know i've heard her on recent podcasts and i think she's really matured over the years you know she talked about how she was contributing to the, the this divisive culture and, you know, taking a step back, having a family made her realize she she um, needed to change the way she approached these issues and do it in a way that connects people and persuades people rather than demonizes people and divides people. So I think that was really uh, a really mature insight of her to have. And so I'm, I'm really kind of happy to see where where she's at now. On a uh, different note, um, has Aaron O'Toole been a failure so far? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, a failure by what standard? I mean, it, it by, of course, by libertarian standards, you know, th there are always failures. Um, uh, he's certainly not what the populist right would like right now. But he's, I think he's doing the things. Look, if you, if you think that what needs to be done is you need your guy to get elected so that the bad guy doesn't get elected. In other words, if your primary goal is to get Trudeau out of office, 
Well, a guy like, um, you know, let's say a populist leader like Maxime Bernier is not going to get Trudeau out of office. You know, he's going to, if he, if Maxime Bernier were taking the populist approach he's taking right now and leading the conservative party, um, he would get, I, I suspect he'd get far fewer votes than Aaron O'Toole would get in a general election. Uh, yes, Max would be much more liked and lauded by uh, conservatives who who think that he'd be standing up for conservative principles, but he'd scare the hell out of people in the center. My, my normie friends, the friends I work with at the fire hall, for example, they don't they don't have really a political bone in their body. They just listen to the news. It's got a leftist slant. It's a leftist culture. And so that they see anything associated with populism or alt-right or, or even just gen, just basic conservatism now as, um, as hateful and bigoted and something that they want nothing to do with. And so if, if you're the leader of, a, of the conservative party and your primary job is to get elected, you can't ignore that. You can't ignore those normies, those centrist votes who, uh, of people who, like my friends are all tired of Justin Trudeau, my colleagues, let's just say at work, they're all tired of Justin Trudeau, but they're scared as hell to vote for a guy. They were scared of Sheer because they, they saw him as socially conservative, as one of those bigots, as one of those people. They certainly see Maxime Bernier that way. Um, and so Aaron O'Toole is a safe place for them to park their vote. Uh, now, is, uh, and, and so I guess what I'm saying is, look, Aaron O'Toole isn't a an inspiring figure. He's not charismatic, but he, if your goal is to get votes, he's probably doing the things that are necessary. He has to pander to the left. He has to fall well within the leftist um, media narrative, the Overton window on the left that that is pulled. You know, Canada is pulled very far leftward in the Overton window, and he's he's doing that. Um, but this this is my problem with mainstream politics. It's that they have the wrong metric of success. Winning votes is not a metric of success. It's almost a metric of, of uh, failure if you are a liberty lover, because you have to reflect culture to get votes. You have to amplify culture. And right now culture is big government. And uh, what we ought to do is challenge culture because until culture, tell, tell our neighbors demand liberty or death, we're not going to see the kind of government we want, no matter who we elect. Even if you were to elect me tomorrow, my, my hands would be tied by institutional bureaucracy, by culture. Um, you know, as, as soon as I started making cuts and, and repealing laws and firing and closing down huge swaths of government departments, uh, the, there would be media stories galore about how I'm threatening the lives and welfare of Canadians and how I'm doing, being reckless and how I'm, a you know, just, like if you think the rhetoric around Trump was bad, wait till you see the rhetoric around a libertarian who starts actually doing stuff. Um, it, it will be the end of the world and people will demand my head on a platter. They will demand a recall. They, they will do everything in their power. So, you know, there's just no way around it. And I, I wish it were as easy as just getting elected and pulling some legislative levers and pulling those, the strings of power and freeing Canadians. But it's not that easy. It's a grind. The only way we get liberty is by shifting culture. And the only way we shift culture is by converting people to liberty, by, by making more libertarians. Uh, we, it's one heart and mind at a time. Um, you know, and so we have to adopt an evangelical mindset, you know, what is going to convert people to libertarianism? Um, and, and that's something to think about. I don't have the answer, but I do know that harsh rhetoric that constantly villainizing people by constantly, you know, it, we, we have to separate the sin from the sinner. We have to recognize, we have to love the person we're talking to in a, in a way. Um, and recognize that underneath that ideological possession is a real person who has good intentions, who wants the same thing we do. They ju they're just possessed by a bad idea, and we need to exercise that demon. And how we do that is through gentle, loving persuasion and using techniques. It, it's not through uh, calling them libtards and doing different things like that. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the approach I take. So Aaron O'Toole, coming back to your question, I, I think he's doing what is necessary to to get votes uh, because even though conservatives hate him right now and see him as a traitor they're 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 going to vote for him over trudeau i see this every election um you know in fact in 2015 i ran 
in a Calgary riding uh, against a, a red Tory named Ron Lightbert. And his cons- his conservative constituents hated his guts. They saw him as a turncoat, as a as a liberal light, uh, you know, and and not a true conservative. And these people went door to door for me. And these were social conservatives. And I mean, they had they had some serious questions about me when they Googled me and saw that the first thing that popped up was, uh, I want gay married couples to protect their marijuana plants with guns. They're like, uh, Tim, what's this about gay and, and marijuana plant? What, what, are you saying we, we should all be doing drugs and getting gay married? I'm like, no, no. You, you, you know, I, it was a, fi- a simple five minute conversation. I'm like, you know, look, morality ought to come from the bottom up, from the church, from the family. It shouldn't come from the government. You know, how's it working out for you now that government's in charge of marriage? Are, are you have any concerns about your church being forced to marry people that they don't want to marry because government controls that institution? And they're like, yeah, OK, you, you have a good point. And then they went door to door for me and they knocked doors and they wanted me. They loved me. They, they wanted me to get elected. But one by one on the eve of election, when they saw how Trudeau was doing, they called me up and they said, Tim, we love you. We've worked hard for you. But much as we love you, we, we hate Trudeau. We can't stand him and we can't risk him getting elected. So we're going to have to hold our nose and vote conservative. And this is what happens every election. Conservatives will hold their nose and vote for their crappy uh, party party leader. And they'll do that again with O'Toole. I have no doubts about it because who else are they going to vote for? You know, a few of them will vote for Bernier. A few of them maybe will vote for the Maverick Party. A few of them might even vote for me. But, you know, that, that's we're talking small numbers there. One, two percent um, are are are, are going to vote do that. The majority of them are going to be too scared of Trudeau to risk him getting into office again. So they'll vote for O'Toole and government will grow at a slightly slower pace than it's growing now because conservative. And, and this is why we say and Michael Malice has, has said that uh, conservatives are just progressives draw, driving the speed limit. Um, you know, they, they have the same policies that the liberals had five or 10 years ago. Uh, and that has always been the case. In fact, there were essays written about this in the late 1800s. That's how long this has been known and ha- about how impotent conservatives are at slowing down the growth of government. And it's because of the strategy, uh, because uh, political action favors those who want to grow the state. It always favors those who want to grow the state. That's how all the incentives are lined up. And so you can't win an election on the idea of shrinking the state because uh, special interest groups and people that are getting freebies now will will wail and gnash their teeth. And, um, you know, the media will say the sky is falling and you won't get elected. So you spoke about um, the Maverick Party. Um, do you think it will have any sort of success on the federal level or do you think it will or do you think it will become like a major thing on the provincial level like um the become like the new ucp or the wild rose party yeah well as far as i know they're only registered as a federal party um you know i i I don't think they're going to gain much traction either way i think they're going to essentially be a fringe party like like we are um and the ppc is and, uh, you know, that, because look, you know, I, I think what they're trying to do is model themselves out after the party Qu- Quebecois, which has strong support in Quebec. But, you know, Quebec uh, sovereignty has a much different flavor than Western sovereignty, let's say. Western sovereignty is all based around the idea that we want nothing to do with Ottawa. They keep screwing us over. Um, but we're not united around a certain set of principles or a, a, an identity, let's say. Whereas in French, it's kind of an aspirational uh, sovereignty. They they see themselves as a, as a special type of person with a special culture, and they want to promote that culture. And they're all centered around that it, more so than they are a political philosophy or something like that. And it's not that they necessarily want to be separate from Ottawa or, or hate, <laughs> hate uh, the federal government so much as they just really love Quebecois culture and want it represented well and we don't really have that in in uh, the west or in alberta so I, I suspect the maverick party will probably um you know be you know a- end up getting about the same amount of votes as as us or the ppc um and uh, you know and they're they're they haven't done anything provincially uh as far as i know or made any moves provincially we have the ucp here uh we have the the wild rose alliance i think just hopped up on the scene as well, and I, I suspect people that are upset with the UCP will probably park their votes with the Wild Rose 
alliance. Uh, but you know, the UCP is is playing it smart as well. They they are making some noises about uh, the issue of separation here in Alberta. They, they're, I think they're even talking about uh, some sort of referendum or uh, town hall. I can't remember what exactly it is, but they're, Kenny seems like he's letting one of his MLAs, uh, I think it's Drew Barnes, um, talk about separation with the constituents. And that keeps Kenny's hands clean. He doesn't have to be the one bringing it up. He can just say he's letting his MLAs uh, explore the issue with their constituents. Um, but it still lets those of us in Alberta who are interested in separating uh, see the UCP as a potential avenue for that to happen. So, um, so I, I, yeah, I, I don't see the Maverick party making much, um, making much ground. And, and again, it's not that there's anything wrong with the Maverick party. I think they have a lot of libertarian principles in them. Um, it's just that I, I know how voters work. They vote against their worst fear. They don't vote for their highest value. That's kind of the system we have. And, um, that's how conservatives operate. Um, you know, until they get really sick of, uh, of a conservative party, they, they won't park their vote anywhere else. Um, so I, I don't see any other party uh, attracting those conservative votes. So you spoke about the People's Party. Um, with their disastrous um, results in the by-elections last year and with most of their um, candidates deregistering, uh, do you think you'll even last till the next election season? Well, I, th I think so. I think Bernier is, um, he's, he's getting a bit of traction right now. Um, you know, he's making anti-lockdown noises and, and doing quite a few things to attract attention. And so, you know, and he's making a decent salary off the, off of the PPC right now. Um, so I, I don't see why he would stop pushing that. Um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, they're, they're going to have another election similar to the last one. They probably won't do as well, actually, because like you say, a lot of their, you know, because, and look, I see this happen in the Libertarian Party all the time, right? So there'll be a new Libertarian or someone discovers these ideas and is just on fire about them and loves them. And, and, and you know, I was this way in 2014, I ran in a by-election. I thought, man, these are the best ideas. I'm just going to have to stand on that stage. People will see how great these ideas are. They'll recognize that they're libertarians at heart and I'll get all these votes. And then when you get two or 3% of the vote, um, it demoralizes you and you, you think about throwing in the towel and quitting. Um, and, and so, you know, I had to change my mindset and realize, look, this, this has never about been about votes. This has been about getting a message out there and converting people to, uh, to a philosophy um, and so if the, if the PPC can find that gear, um, then great. Uh, you know, I think, but the problem is I don't know that they have a particular philosophy. I mean, one of the things that killed the merge we had with the PPC is Bernier refused to get me a, a statement of principles or anything like that. Um, and you know, I have a feeling it's because Bernier is, is a pragmatic political animal. He'll do what is popular, what gets, what serves him the most. And that is popularity. Uh, you know, he's changed from a separatist to a status quo um, uh, conservative to uh, a libertarian conservative in the in the leadership race. And then when he went to form his own party, he transitioned to being a populist. And he did all, made all those moves very consciously to to get support, to get the kind of support that was going to help him um, do well. And so I, I don't think he's hardcore on philosophy um, or a movement like like we are here in the libertarian party and so it's going to be hard for him to maintain uh you know when his sole focus is getting votes and support it's going to be hard for him to continue maintaining that support when they don't do when they do even worse in the next election um it's gonna you know inevitably he's going to lose support and lose momentum and um people are gonna are gonna get tired of it and and a lot of people are tired of seeing no avenue to challenge leadership or, um, you know, any option for them to have input in the platform and, and do things like that. And so I think that's going to, I think that, you know, I, I think they'll get through the next election, but it's up in the air whether they, they make it uh, to the election after that. So um, would you put still want to merge with the People's Party? 
Um, no, we crossed that bridge and, um, I don't trust Bernie anymore. I, I wanted to believe in him. I wanted to trust him. Uh, but he, he burned me. He, he said he was going to do something. He didn't do it. And, you know, he knew that we had been talking for two months about merging. Um, and I really wanted it to happen. And I thought it was going to be great for the Liberty movement. I thought it was, you know, and I, I really had a lot of hopes and I was kind of projecting a lot of, uh, a lot onto Bernier thinking that he could be our Ron Paul. And, you know, I, I kind of kept the blinders on to a lot of his um, patterns in the past and, and didn't want to see him for who he was. Um, you know, one of the first questions he asked me when we start talking about the merge is how the, how the party was incorporated. How, what was the corporate structure? How was it incorporated and registered as a party? And um, that should have been my first red flag. Uh, I thought it was kind of odd. It wasn't, you know, I wanted to talk about uh, platform and principles and, and uh, you know, constitution and that sort of thing. He didn't even really want to talk about that stuff. He just wanted to know how how the party was incorporated and you know we found out later that he incorporated the ppc under his name him and his two other buddies and so um he basically owns that party and he's kind of the ruler for life and and you know he has control over all the funds access to them and and all that sort of thing so uh, i suspect that was probably why he was very concerned and very interested in how the corporate structure was and then you know we started kicking the tires on the smurge and and you know, rolling it out to media a little bit. And uh, I, ta I was talking to my party membership about it. And, uh, you know, I was going to need seven eighths of our membership vote. And I thought I could get that. I thought I could make a convincing case for it. Um, but, you know, we really wanted to make sure there's a strong statement of principles because we hadn't seen that yet. And some of his policies seemed a little weak. They weren't extremely libertarian. His foreign policy was, was sketchy. It's talked about, you know, um, projecting military force into other countries and killing, you know, people in other countries and stuff. And that definitely wasn't very libertarian. And, you know, a lot of us were concerned with the fact that he was a bit of a hawk in his uh, previous iterations. And, you know, we would like to have seen a debate where he, he could debate me and I could hold his feet to the fire and we could hear him apologize and say he turned a new leaf and all those kinds of things. Uh, and, and he's now, <laughs> you know, found the gospel of liberty and, and he's he's committed to it hardcore um but he didn't want any of those things you know so we, we started this conversation and our members were starting to migrate over to the ppc i lost my deputy leader to the ppc some of our executive directors because we expected this merge to happen and then bernie just ghosted me um and i, I guess he told one of his aides that he got what he needed from the libertarian party and what did he have he had a good chunk of my leadership team and he had a, a lot of our members and so he basically <laughs> left us in the dust so i learned uh, a hard political lesson about how machiavellian let's say politics can be and and self-serving these these people are and um so now i don't trust bernier at all and um i, I would never merge um with him unless you know there was some serious um mea culpa as an ex explanations that occurred uh you know now and and look I, I i think in retrospect it was a mistake for me to even consider the merge uh because the libertarian name means something and if we're going to change the name of the party to something that sounds frankly kind of commie um you know that that is a huge move um we need to hold we need to not be afraid to be libertarian we should be proud of it and we should you know we should be the standard that that other parties have to elevate to we shouldn't compromise ever and i'm kind of embarrassed that i was considering the the merge now in in retrospect so um one of our users asks how can libertarians get elected and make their political position appeal to people whether it be through a third party or a major party yeah. Well, I mean, I think the only way libertarians ever get elected is if we if we have a libertarian constituency, right? Well, there there are two ways we get elected. One is we join the conservative party and talk like Aaron O'Toole. Um, <laughs> but I mean, that doesn't get us any kind of win. I mean, it gets us elected, but then what? Now what? What what do you do when you get elected? You you keep growing the government is what you do because you've done nothing meaningful to challenge culture. 
And so I think the idea of chasing votes is, is a red herring. I think it's a distraction. I think you need to be willing to trade away all the votes to, to change one person's heart and mind to being a libertarian. Uh, but that being said, there may be opportunities in certain constituencies, right? I mean, we, we can look at the Green Party as uh, kind of a blueprint about how they did it. And, and we've we watched the Green Party grow over the years and Elizabeth May's success. And uh, what she did was... Um, you know, they, they, in one election, they dumped their entire party war chest into the riding she was running in, and she did. She failed miserably. Um, the next election, they spread their their party's war chest, and they, they ran a full slate of candidates. And Elizabeth May got lots of media attention, got out there, and established herself as a kind of a household name. And in the election, they that election, they figured out which riding was most friendly to the Green Party, and then then the. Following that, they dumped their entire war chest into that riding and got Elizabeth May elected. So I think that's a, a viable strategy for libertarians to look at. And so the strategy I, I, I want to take here is run as many candidates as possible and, um, and get as much media attention as possible, uh, become, you know, put the party on the map, make it a household name, and, and then take a look at the polling numbers and see which riding might be most amenable to me dropping into, let's say, or, or the leader of the party at the time dropping into and putting our entire war chest in that riding and, and making a go of it. I suspect it would be a riding, uh, it would be a rural riding or, or maybe a riding in the in maybe the territories or something like that where, where people just don't see much use for government because they're self-sufficient and, and personally responsible. Um, definitely probably not going to be an urban riding, uh, definitely not going to be a Toronto or anything like that. Um, but th that, that's a potential, but I think the first thing you have to do is get popularized these ideas. And we really have to focus on popularizing the ideas rather than popularizing ourselves and trying to get elected. Um, because popularizing ourselves requires a lot of sacrificing our ideas and not saying uncomfortable truths that need to be said. And we, we have to stand on that say, stage and say things that aren't going to be popular and aren't going to win us any votes, but that need to be said. And that will slowly s seep into the minds of, of C Canadians and, and we'll be able to pull people out of, the, out of the, that crowd that are, are amenable to our ideas and open to them. And, and we'll build up momentum that way. And then when the time's right, we can get elected. But you know, by the time we, we convert enough people to libertarianism, um, if that's if that happens and if that's possible, uh, you'll see the other parties quickly adopt our platform, and and so uh, you know it may it may be that libertarians will never get elected, but as long as our ideas make it into the mainstream political and shift the Overton window, the other mainstream parties will have to do that, and and you see this happening. Uh, you know, if you look at the national debate stage, it's not the Justin Trudeau and Aaron O'Toole that are uh, that are advancing ideas on that stage. It's the radicals that are doing that. It's the Jagmeet Singhs and the Elizabeth Mays, and more precisely, it's the radicals in their parties that are saying r radical extremist leftist things. And those ideas are are slowly seeping their way onto that main stage because they're seeping their way into culture. And so now Trudeau has to talk about green agendas. He has to talk about universal basic income. He has to talk about wokeness. And so does Aaron O'Toole. And they have to do that because of the radicals that um, are advancing their principles. And so what we need to do is look, observe that. Observe that it's not the, the people that are winning all the votes and that are, are uh, getting all the power that are... Um, that are controlling things. It's the radicals that are out there unabashedly and unashamedly um, advancing their, uh, their principles and their agenda uh, in, in the cultural milieu. And so we need to do the same thing. So that, that's what I focus on. Now, that being said, if you really want to get elected, there are opportunities, I would say, at the local level in, in municipal politics. And I know the Libertarian Party in the U.S. has had some good success with this. And, uh, you know, we don't really have party politics at the municipal level, but you could run on libertarian ideas at the municipal level. I think you're going to run into some issues um, trying to advance any kind of libertarian ideas, but it would certainly be better having libertarians on council than it would be having a, a socialist on there. I mean, at least you could try to advance some ideas. I, I was elected to... Um, uh, the, the Alberta College of Paramedics 
uh, and served there for three years. Um, I just finished my term off last year. And so I sat on the regulator for the Alberta College of Paramedics. Now, you know, I, I was able to push some libertarian ideas and kind of bring some libertarian perspective to that board table. But there wasn't any dramatic changes that occurred to the, the regulatory body because I got elected. And, you know, that's because it's embedded in this huge national structure and then provincial structure that that needs to change before anything else can change. So, so, you know, there's, there's limited things that you can do just by, by getting elected. You, you know, politicians are really chained down by, by the culture and the culture is left-wing and authoritarian right now. And so we have to change that and chain it down to a libertarian agenda. That requires being radical and, and, and you know, not, not having all sorts of popularity and, and being willing to trade votes for advancing ideas. Um, one of our users asks, how would you respond to the claim that anarcho-capitalism isn't true anarchism? Um, yeah, I, I, well, I, I think I think it is. Um, you know, uh, you, you look, you own yourself, you own the stuff you appropriate in nature that is unowned. Um, and, and so who else has a right to that? I, I would say that anarcho-communism isn't true anarchism, um, you know, because they say, for example, that rent is theft. And, and, and so if rent is violence, if charging someone rent to live in a house that you built, let's say, or that you appropriated out of nature, um, well, then, then they are justified in, in ruling you. They're justified in using violence to take that property from you or, or um, stop you from evicting them or something like that. And so, you know, it, it, these base principles really matter when it comes down to it. And, and you, need to, you need to have a coherent philosophy underscoring them. And I, and I don't see how any, anything else has a coherent set of moral principles behind it. I think that the moral principle you own yourself and the things you appropriate in nature and the things that you freely trade for, nat I think the natural result of that is anarcho-capitalism. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd love, love to hear how those principles are wrong. Do you not own yourself? Do you not own the things you appropriate in nature? How do you determine who has control or ownership over a given resource. And, you know, I, I think the anarcho communists and socialists say that anyone who's using it at that moment is who has control over it. But, uh, you know, I think that is, um, that that's incoherent. I, I don't think that that can stand, you know, as soon as you set something down, does that mean someone else can now take it and control it and own it. Um, you know, I think that that is a philosophy that is rife with contradictions and, um, and rife for, for conflict. So you're muted there, um, little Bill. I don't know if you're trying to talk to me or not. But. Let's see here. All right, I'm not hearing sorry, anyone. Sorry about that. Um, oh, no there's worries. There's a situation going on in my house. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Oh, I'm sorry. Um... So, what are your thoughts on um, the Equality Act just got passed in the United States? The Equality Act. Uh, well, I don't know what that is, but uh, can you can you describe it a little bit to me? I, I have a feeling I know what it is. Basically, it requires that all LGBTQ and women and all that be treated equally under the law, under the Civil Rights Act of 1968, I think. Hmm. Okay, so they're adding more to the Civil Rights Act. I mean, this sounds a little bit like C-16 here in Canada, where, you know, they essentially added uh, gender expression to the Charter of Rights. Um, and, you know, 
part of the issue is then, you know, as a libertarian, you know, I can't deny that the civil right, I, I can't deny that the Civil Rights Act had some positive effects. I, I wish they could have got there without violence, and I suspect they would have. Um, and, you know, but but by the same token, you know, we now have uh, less less uh, discrimination. But as a libertarian, you know, I say, you know, I can I can discriminate against anyone for any reason when it comes to my body and my property. Um, you know, if, if, if I don't like your face, I don't have to have sex with you. You, you, you don't get access to my body if I, if I don't, you know, I, and I can, for the same reason, say, well, you, you know, you can't buy my, um, you can't come into my store or something like that. Of course, you know, if I don't want to make money, uh, I guess that that's something I can say. Not a very successful business model, which is why I think the free market is the best way to kind of eliminate um, discrimination. It's it, it, because obviously if everyone's discriminating and you're a, a compet, you decide to compete with, uh, your competitors, your competitive advantage is you don't discriminate. You take anyone's money, no matter what color, shape, or size they are. And um, and pretty soon the other uh, businesses have to do the same, uh, you know, because they love money more than they hate a particular um, race or ethnicity or something like that. So I, I prefer that that route. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I uh, And, you know, I, th I think there's going to be problems as well with... Um, with hiring for the same reason that uh, this trans lady I talked to today was talking about with Bill C-16, where if you hire someone who has the weight of the law behind them, um, then you, you can, then they'll, they'll, employers will just not hire you um, because of that, right? And so they'll identify you as one of these minorities that has a special protected class in the civil rights act and um they'll say well this is going to be a recipe for disaster uh you know if if uh, they want to use this law against so I, I think there could be some negative unintended consequences but overall you know it, it's not uh, not something i would uh i hate terribly you know I, I do think it's bad to discriminate people for their against their gender and i'm not sure how bad the civil rights act really was for america um, I don't think it was terrible, but you know, I'm, I'm not that well versed in it. So I, I don't know. All right. Have you read, uh, the machinery of freedom by, uh, David, D. David Friedman? Friedman. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great book. Uh, love it. Um, I love it, like the approach he takes as well. It's, uh, you know, that pragmatic approach. Um, you know, I know Rothbard wasn't a big fan of that. He wrote, he wrote a, uh, an essay in response to David Friedman, I think it was called, Do You Hate the State? Where he talks about how even though David Friedman is, you know, he he talk, he kind of criticizes Friedman because he says, look, Friedman comes at, um, comes to anarchism because it's the most efficient and effective economic model. And one gets the impression from that, that if it were, uh, if communism were the most efficient and effective economic model, then he'd support that. And Rothbard just cannot abide by this. And so I'm kind of sympathetic to Rothbard here, but I did like, really like the book because it, it's another way of uh, at fleshing out your arguments. Because, you know, look, I was a minarchist until I heard some practical, I think it was Stefan Molyneux's um, essay on Lou Rockwell uh, called Cage the Devils or something like that. And, and it talked about how private law could work um, and, how, and that uh, just understanding or having that picture of how a statelessness, statelessness could um, deal with criminals um, allowed me to, to you know, accept anarcho-capitalism. I already accepted all the principles. I just couldn't quite get past the, the practical problems that I could, that my imagination was coming with, up with. And so I think David Friedman's book really does a good job of debunking a lot of the practical arguments. And I think that's an important thing to do. So, um, so I, I did like the book. So, um, what is one policy or law you want passed federally in Canada? Sorry, I, I missed that. What is one policy or law that you want passed federally across Canada? Ooh, uh, I want the Taxation is Theft Act uh, to pass. Uh, a law that outlaw, outlaws involuntary funding of government. 
and uh, makes it a, a capital offense to extort money violently from people, even if you're the government. I think that would be a great law to have. Do you think uh, the governor general would ever sign that? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. Uh, no, of course not. I go, look, that law is never going to pass um, muster until we have a population that, that wants it to. Um, and then, you know, I think uh, the queen will, will have no choice. I mean, what's she going to do? She wants to be our queen. She's going to have to go along with it or we'll just, you know, cut off the monarchy. We'll cut off them even having a vestige of a figurehead left in Canada. What do you think is the best approach to um, getting rid of the monarchy? Well, I mean, you could do revolution, I suppose. But, um, you know, I, look, it, it would be easy to do here in Canada now. You wouldn't need any kind of violent revolution like the U Americans did. Um, you, you would just have to have the will from the people and then the government to do it and you know it's not like the uk is going to send over warships to to you know keep us in the commonwealth and and under queen elizabeth or anything like that so yeah i don't think it would be that hard to to do uh to be honest you think the governor general would give up her cushy job that easily oh you know she she would uh well look yeah she's essentially appointed by the prime minister's office. Right. And so I'm sure, um, you know, I'm sure that there are, yeah, she, yeah, she, I, I can't see her like Julie Payette was just basically fired. Um, the governor general of Canada, uh, because of the way she treated her staff and, you know, she went without a lot of fanfare. I mean, if she wants to operate in this society without a lot of hatred towards her, she wants to have a life after governor generalship. Uh, she'll she'll leave without much of a fuss um, or, you know, the peasants will have her head. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think it'll be it'd be that big a deal. And you know, look, you could uh, you could set her up with a publisher and say, look, you could go write a book deal about how hard done by you are and make a million bucks um, telling your side of the story or something like that. It's not like that. They're going to be hard pressed to make a buck after being a governor general and being the first one ousted. With uh, Biden um, officially resuming the bombing of not only Syria, but also Iranian-backed uh, groups and um, reopening child um, migration camps, as you like yeah. to call them, was he really the lesser of two evils or was he the exact same? Well, he's the worst of two evils um, because he's doing it with the moral sanction of uh, the government and, and of the culture, right? Uh, you know, there, there's that old, I think it was Lysander Spooner who wrote, uh, talked about the difference between the highwayman, like the, the highway robber and the state. You know, the, the, the highway robber, um, after he robs you, doesn't demand you thank him and think that he's doing a, a fantastic job for you and the world by robbing you. He knows he did something bad and he's not proud of it, but he did it. Whereas the government robs you and then continues to follow you and demand thanks and demand penance and, and demand pats on the back because of all the virtue they're doing by robbing you. And that, that's what Biden reminds me of. He, he is bombing, um, you know, look, you saw the tweets um, from, from leftists talking about what a refreshing uh, bombing that this was when there was no fanfare. It was just quietly done without any braggadociousness or anything. It, like they were just extolling the virtues of Biden's bombs, um, you know, as if he was doing it so much more competently than Trump and with so much more compassion and, and consideration uh, than Trump. And so now that we've got this, um, and, and I even see it on, you know, I was watching Fox News a little bit today and, and Republicans are talking about how great it is that we're returning to sound foreign policy again. Um, you know, where America is a policeman of the world and, and projecting all this uh, military might. Um, yeah, they, they, this is far worse 
than Trump. At least Trump um, was the devil every time he did anything. Uh, and he, he put a healthy skepticism in the minds of Americans about, about government, I think, I, I would like to hope. But Biden is erasing all that with his uh, saccharine smile and his uh, virtue signaling and fake compassion. So, yeah, I think it's a lot worse. So um, with um, with Kamala Harris, um, do you think that she'll be even worse than Biden? Well, um, it, it's hard to say. I mean, look, they're both swamp creatures. They are both going to do whatever the establishment demands of them. Um, Kamala Harris, uh, you know, has done some horrible things. Um, in the past, so is Biden. Uh, Kamala Harris will, you know, will be able to get away with more than Biden. She'll she'll have a social license to do things because, uh, you know, she's a woman and she's a woman of color, um, and and so yeah, I think that uh, she'll be she'll be able to do things that um, a white man may not be able to do by virtue of the fact that he's uh, he might be seen as patriarchal by some, some of those in the left when he does things, but she, you can't lobby that, um, that, uh, insult at her. You can't call her patriarchal because she's a oppressed minority that is doing this. So how dare you call her patriarchal? So I think she'd be, she'd be able to get away with a lot more than, than Biden for sure. So, I mean, um, we, we kind of saw this with Hillary Clinton too, right? I mean, she was able to bomb, Lebanon with basic impunity and do all these crazy things that, uh, uh, you know, men in her position might not have been able to get away with. So you said along the lines of that people vote to take away their biggest fears. Is that not the point of voting to take away your fears and ensure that you're living in a way that's safest? Yeah, I think that that's, uh, one way to look at voting, I think people generally vote to avoid their biggest fears or to alleviate their biggest fear for sure. I mean, this is how politics works, right? They, they, you drum up hobgoblins or, or, or scary things or anxieties, and then you pose as the answer to that. And if you just cast your vote with me, I'll take that all away. You know, I think uh, people that vote for the Libertarian Party, who they know isn't going to win any elections, probably vote for different reasons. They vote to send a message. Um, and, you know, what I tell people is when you vote for us, yeah, we're, we're not going to win the election, but let's say we get five or 10% of the vote. Um, now other people start noticing us. It's kind of like giving your uh, favorite podcaster a few, uh, some dollars to promote their show, right? The more votes we get, the more spotlight we get on our ideas. So I think people that vote for the Libertarian Party are voting for a different reason than the majority of voters. But um, yeah, I think by and large, you vote to, to uh, you know, alleviate your fear. What do you think about the Austrian school versus the Chicago school? Um, well, I, I definitely favor the Austrian school. I think... Um, you know, I have a lot of respect for Milton Friedman and the boys there in Chicago, but, uh, you know, they had, you know, their, their ideas kind of lead to um, not great policies in some way. You know, he, Milton Friedman, for example, had the negative income tax. Um, they they resort to a little bit more central planning and, and government interventionism with their line of thinking. Uh, and, and, you know, I think Austrians get it right. Um, but, you know, I think they're both, both uh, like, you, you know, if you're well versed in Chicago economics, I, I think you're a good ally. You're, you can be a good libertarian and be a Chicago economist. Um, it says that you are a filmmaker. Have you ever used your influence as a libertarian party leader or friendships with others in the film industry to promote your, promote your party's ideals? If so what messages and what goals are you yeah. working to achieve using this message? Yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 you know, when I became party leader, I kind of put my filmmaking days behind. God, that, that was kind of my side hustle as a firefighter. Every firefighter kind of has a side hustle. Um, 
you know, and, and actually that filmmaking kind of opened up the political opportunity. I did some f film work with uh, Neil Young and Daryl Hannah and, um, you know, I wrote about it and, and there's a lot of libertarian themes in that writing. And so, you know, I tried to use my influence when I was working with all these people that were coming up to Fort McMurray to the oil sands region. And, um, and I, I was a big booster for my community, for my town, for the industry. Um, but, you know, so when these environmental started to come to town and slag my community and slag the industry, I, I uh, made it my mission to volunteer on their <laughs> film sets and be director of photography or whatever they wanted me to be. And I would try to throw them a little bit of cognitive dissonance, right? I, I wanted to show the beauty of my town and the great things that were coming out of this um, oil industry. And, and the, you know, the fact that Fort McMurray was the most charitable community per capita in Canada because of all the wealth of the oil industry that we had an incredible environmental consciousness and they were actually developing environmental solutions because of this environmental consciousness they had all thanks to capitalism and energy liberalization. And, uh, you know, and, and so I tried to, to get, get that message out and I had a little bit of success with that. I know at least one uh, film that didn't get made because the filmmakers that came up just couldn't in good consciousness slam the town like they were planning to. So, um, so I had some success with that, but you know, I, I haven't uh, used it, uh, you know, I've, that much I, you know i still have some talents and skills i guess of video editing but man it's a it's uh it takes a lot of work to get some of that stuff done um but you know maybe it's maybe it's something i should focus on because good storytelling is important to, to get a message you know we can talk about philosophy and abstract ideas all the time but if you can tell those um if you could portray those messages through the medium of story then i think they're they get through to to a lot more people. So it's, it's something um, you're, you're making me think about right now, actually. I was going to ask um, why you didn't use uh, your connections to like Neil Young to further the Libertarian Party, but then I realized he supported Trudeau. So that would have been a bit off. Yeah, he's, he, well, look, Neil, I didn't make any, <laughs> any friends with Neil after I wrote about our experience, my experience, you know, because I, I basically pointed out Neil's hypocrisy. And there, there's no way these left-wing progressives, you know, they, they, these guys, a lot of them like me. They, they like me on a personal level. And we have, um, you know, uh, I guess, reasonable political debates, polite political debates, um, and, and we're still pals kind of thing. But they would never support me politically. Uh, the, these people are, you know, they're like Neil Young. His identity is built around the green movement. And he would never jeopardize that identity to throw his weight behind me or anything like that. Uh, you wrote in an op-ed for the Huffington Post that the right needs principle, not unity. Can you explain on what that means? Yeah, well, it, it's just, you know, kind of what we've been talking about uh, off and on. And it's this idea that uh, Aaron O'Toole is trying to be all things to all people. Um, and that means that the government's going to grow if and when he, if he wins an election, uh, because he has to, to make good on his promises and, and, you know, give the people the free stuff that, that got him elected. And, uh, you know, this is, this is what happened. And, you know, I think I wrote that article at a time when, uh, people were really saying, look, we need to unify the right. And it was when Notley um, became premier of Alberta. And, you know, she won in large part because the right was fractured. You had the Wild Rose Party, which was trying to take a more principled conservative approach. And then you had the, the PCs, the progressive conservatives who had been the ruling party for years and people were tired of them. And all the conservatives were saying, we need unity. We can't have the Wild Rose Party ruining the election. And this and that. And, um, and I said, I, I said, look, at some point, if we want to take back Western civilization, it would be great if conservatives or the major conservative party took a principled stance and, and um, actually advanced conservative ideas and was unapologetic about it and uncompromising about it. Um, because that's the only thing that gets us to where we're, we're going to go. 
Uh, so that that's what I meant. And and because they, they constantly unify around whatever is going to get them in power. And what gets them into power in today's day and age is um, pandering to the left. And so you're going to have to do that. If that's what you want. If you want unity, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get uh, more leftist uh, policies. I have, we're approaching the end of this AMA, so I'm gonna ask. This could be like the second last question I'm gonna ask. Um, do you think climate change is an existential existential threat to humanity? And if so, what should we do about it? Yeah, I'm not convinced that it is. You know, I think um, I think that it's it's uh, gonna have harmful effects. Uh, certainly in some places of the earth and it's going to have beneficial effects in other places. I don't, you know, I don't know enough about the science to say that it's going to be catastrophic. Um, but I do say that if it is going to be catastrophic, then we need to push the pe gas pedal down on Liberty more than ev ever. You know, I hate it when I, I didn't like it uh, when Maxime Bernier, for example, said that uh, climate change isn't a catastrophe or an emergency. Therefore, we don't need the government because that implies that we're gonna need the government if it is catastrophic. And uh, I say, no, I say liberty is the answer for everything. I will not concede one inch to the enemy here and say that we're gonna need government to deal with a catastrophe. No, we won't, we need liberty. And you know, I wrote an article about this in the Post Millennial uh, uh, talking about why liberty is the answer to uh, climate change or climate catastrophe. Um, and you know, what I propose is, um, uh, a system of torts where if you if it can be shown in a court of law that your climate that, that your co2 emissions or emissions are harming someone else's property uh, by maybe raising sea levels or whatever um, then you owe them damages um, you you don't owe the government a tax you don't owe them damages they're, they're not going to do anything good with that money so you can't be in favor of a carbon tax you, you can't pay a fee to damage property let's say um, but if you do damage something, you can pay. And I think something like uh, 80 or 90 co big corporations are responsible for the majority of the greenhouse gases on on Earth. So if, if there is climate catastrophe that can be proven in a court of law by experts, you know, batting it about and that there are provable uh, victims that are linked to that. Well, then I think you you have a um, like a tort or a class action lawsuit where these big companies pay out to the the victims that they create, and you know the the end result is energy is a bit more expensive for the rest of us. Um, but you know that, that's true in any case. If you're if a corporation you do business with is causing damage, um, why well, you know the the, the lawsuits. Uh, the price of those lawsuits end up filtering down to the consumer. So, uh, you know, I, I think that is the, the a better approach to it. And then you get gets out of the court of the public opinion and gets into a real court where you, in theory, have a, an objective justice that is trying to uh, look at the expert testimony and, and weigh which is the most compelling um, and, and then assess damages on that. But, you know, I, I think uh, that's, a, you know, so again, uh, whether climate catastrophe is happening, I, I'm skeptical that it is. I, I don't think it is. I think that a, imposing energy poverty certainly would be catastrophic um, because it, it makes the environment for humans much less livable. You know, we, we get clean water, pharmaceuticals. You know, the, the environment's constantly trying to kill us. Uh, my furnace died today and it's minus 17 here. And, um, you know, if it hadn't been for the furnace repairman and the natural gas, that comes into our home, uh, you know, we'd be in ha facing an emergency right now. Um, so don't take away my energy. Um, you know, that would be the, the environment would kill me if, if you did that. It would be an environmental catastrophe if you took away my energy because my life would be in it. And, and the way I like to frame these debates is, um, you know, Alex Epstein has a good way of saying this. He says, you know, when, when you're debating these things with people, you have to get at the base principle. There are two ways to look at the climate change debate. And you have to look at what the highest value is. And if your highest value is minimizing human impact on nature, let's say, well, then humans have to go. Because if it's between that group of trees over there and New York City, uh, while well, we have to we have to privilege the group of trees, we can't have uh, a flourishing city. 
my number one priority is human flourishing. And so the environment needs to support human flourishing. And uh, humans need to be able to uh, uh, change the environment to, to, in order to flourish. We need to cut down trees. We need to extract resources. We need to transform resources into energy and different things like that. And that, and in fact, every biological organism has to do that to some level in order to survive on this planet. And we're no different. And so the, the question then becomes, at what point does climate change impact human flourishing? And no one seems to be interested in that question at all. The only question I ever see is uh, what's happening to trees and grass and coral beds and different things like that. And, um, you know, nothing really about how it's impacting human flourishing. So I'd like to see science take a look at that a little bit more. All right. Um, the final question of the night. Um, with the next election cycle either being a year off or less than a year off, depending on whether the NDP wants to turn their back on the Liberals, um, how would the Libertarians market themselves in a what's essentially an economic crisis uh, brought on yeah. by the COVID pandemic. Well, what we have to do is uh, is keep hammering uh, against the the economic lockdown. I think um, you know hammering the economic lo lockdown, hammering against the this unprecedented wealth transfer from the lower and middle classes to the oligarchs. Um, and, and, you know, this impending great reset in the UBI and everything else that, that comes along with that. Uh, I think those are two primary issues that we really need to, to focus on, uh, you know, the corporate welfare and, and the crushing of the little guy. Um, and, and we, we really need to, and, and I mean, th this should be, uh, an easy sell, right? Because so many people are tired of the lockdowns. They're tired of having their liberty infringed. They see through the the horrible rhetoric um, and, and the the lies that everyone's saying that that you know this is all being done in the name of of saving lives, and we see clearly that lives are being destroyed by this, not saved by it. And so I think that's the primary message we're going to have to have going into the next election is really hammering economic freedom and um, that, you know, libertarians would never shut down the economy. Even if the virus was 100% fatal immediately, we wouldn't shut down the economy. We wouldn't infringe on liberty because at some point you need to leave your house and get food and, and look after your family and you need to be able to manage your own risk and take your own risks and, and weigh the pros and cons yourself. And so, um, so we need to figure out how to make make a compelling message that way, I think. Any uh, final remarks or anything that we missed? No, thanks for having me on. Uh, you can you can check out my personal um, website is timmoen.net and you can sign subscribe to my newsletter there. Uh, I try to put out a newsletter every week or so. Um, and of course you can go to our party page, libertarian.ca. And, oh, I also have a podcast. It's called the Liberty Experts. Uh, we usually put out two podcasts a week and, uh, that's on Apple iTunes and on YouTube as well. So you can check us out there.